Heights. How's everybody doing? Good. I want to do better than Scott. Well, it's great you can go with that. Show him. No, it's all right. Well, it's great to be here and get a chance to talk with you. And uh, by the way, just a small comment. I love that we start off with prayer. Uh, I, I graduated from here uh, back in 93, and it's, uh, it's great to be back and a chance to talk with you and share stories. Uh, I was presenting up at the University of Utah here a few weeks ago, and when I asked someone if they'd say a prayer, they were shocked. Okay. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me better now? All right, there we go. Thank you. Okay, so a little bit about us, and then uh, I'd like to tell you some stories. Uh, but we, um, we currently work with around 500 national brands, about 350 employees, uh, with employees in six different countries. Uh, offices uh, here in Salt Lake is our headquarters, but up in Toronto, in Mississauga, also in uh, Melbourne, and in Australia, and Birmingham, England. Uh, we've been growing quite a bit. Uh, we um, kind of defied the odds when it came to a bootstrap company. I'll talk a little bit about bootstrap versus VC companies. And some of the things we do. We gather insights for over one, from one, over 100 countries and 100 plus languages. Uh, work with some of the most famous brands you've probably ever heard of. But I'd like to show this slide first just because it's, it shows us beating Qualtrics mostly. <laughs> I don't like about those ones. Hey look, we did it! We beat them. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> We're the, we're the scrappy uh, bootstrap company compared to the behemoths that have raised a lot of money. Uh, but this was a, a great validation of our space. Uh, who's heard of Forrester, the analyst company? Okay, some of you have heard of Forrester. Uh, this was their first uh, wave they've done in our space, which is a nice validation of our space uh, because they get in once they do that. This is what businesses use to make the decision of who they should talk to. And so it was a great, uh, great uh, uh, success story for us this last year having beat them in the wave. Uh, they do this once every two years, so we get a brag for two years on having beaten them. So some of the places uh, we've done things, hang on, this, this clicker's a little bit jumpy on me. Uh, we collect data in a lot of places. Uh, anybody heard of Yelp? Of course you have, right? So Yelp in their 17 years has collected around 120 million customer reviews. Last year, we collected 150 million. So in one year, we collect more data, more customer reviews than Yelp does in their lifetime. So we're kind of that company behind the scenes collecting experiences for businesses. And we use that information to help businesses know what's working, what's breaking, what employees are doing well and failing, to help businesses design better products. We're a real-time market research, on-the-fly type of organization. It's a big change from the way the world used to be. And we do it for some pretty amazing brands. Uh, all across the world. A lot of these brands were in dozens of countries for them, uh, as well as collecting data in dozens of different languages. Uh, it's a, my mom was asking, as try, she asked me to try to explain it to her what we did, and I said, well, we're in the smile business, where they're des helped to design uh, great experiences for guests, so that we as customers have great experiences. And that's what we do for these brands. We help them ensure they deliver great experiences. I'm sure some of you have had a chance to understand the customer journey, and journey mapping, uh, moments of truth. Uh, that's what we do. We collect the experiences of guests at all these kind of unique moments of truth and help businesses understand what's working and what's not. Uh, some of the ways we do that uh, is through our text analytics abilities. So we built a, a chatbot equivalent uh, a few years ago here before chatbots are actually popular called Active Listening. And we interact with guests as they share their experiences in, in the dialogue boxes with us. Uh, we analyze what they share with us. And we tell businesses when something's changed. Uh, it's pretty hard to read 10,000 comments a day. But our technology allows us to read those comments, understand what people are saying is good and bad, and automatically surface it so businesses know exactly what's going right and wrong. We also analyze from an impact standpoint in the business, the bottom line. So we're able to go through and use customer experience data to build predictability models. Uh, for those of you that ever worked with predictability models, a good predictability model is about 50 or 60% accurate. You know, predicting the future is a hard business. But when we add in our customer experience data, something kind of amazing happens. 
predictability models are all about trying to figure out what a human being will do in that next situation. And most predictability models are based upon transactional information, the, the facts of what happened. Well, we're human beings. We don't necessarily make decisions based upon facts. We make decisions based more upon how we feel regarding something. So when we add in our customer experience data, something amazing happens. It goes from a 50 or 60% accuracy of predicting the future to 90%. So the data that we have changes the way businesses make decisions much more accurately. Come on. I think I'll just touch it. That's not working. Um, we also do a lot of things with big data. Uh, understanding nuances that are occurring in data across the business organizations and surface that up through all levels of an organization. We have about a half million users log into our platform every day, uh, covering around 250,000 storefronts. So a lot of businesses use us every day to know what's working and what's not. A little bit about my experience. And what I hope I could kind of talk about a, a little bit differently is what I call the difference between a, a VC company and a bootstrap company. My first experience out of school, I was lucky enough to be at a bootstrap company. Anyone tell me what a bootstrap company is? There's prizes involved. Yeah. You do it on your own money. Do it on your own, right? You're, you're, you maybe use your mother or someone's basement or something else, right? You go through and do that. Here, I'll throw you something. This is to encourage everybody else to ask questions. <laughs> oh, here we go. Google speaker. Here you go. Okay. <laughs> Next question. Next question. Okay. Yeah, your hand's already up back there. Um, <laughs> Good call. So my first company, though, was Sterling Wentworth, a financial software company. And they were 15 years old when I joined them, making $2 million in revenue a year. 15 years at $2 million, right? That's not really growing very fast. Well, I had a chance to go in and be involved with designing products for these guys. And for the next six years, I designed their products, and we saw the business go from $2 million to $20 million. And it was a 10x multiple on this business. It was a really cool experience. And I had a chance to gain ownership in that business and have a seven-figure event pretty soon out of school. I, I was, it was a great experience for me. And it was one in which I sit there and say, well, why would you want to do business any other way? It was kind of a cool kind of thing for me. And then the dot-com happened. Scott, you had a lot of fun in the dot-com, right? Oh, yeah. um, and uh, every business seemed to be taking money from these magical VCs that were just throwing money around like crazy. And we, we got 20 some odd million dollars and spent it two and a half years and I had a lot of really sore experiences with that. And I'll talk about some of those. Uh, having to close the doors on a business and see you know, 50 of your friends go out hunting for jobs changes a little bit, right? Okay. And then my current company that I started 16 years ago, we bootstrapped it. Started from the ground up. It was in the year 2002, right after the dot-com crashed and there was 2002 was a rough year in Utah, by the way. Five million dollars was the total amount of outside money we got that year. That was for the, every business in Utah. That's <laughs> like nothing. How, how much did we get last year? Over a billion? Oh, yeah. I think it was over a billion in Utah yeah. of outside money. Yeah. Kind of crazy. So dot com kind of put the kibosh on a lot of that stuff anyways. So the question, what's the difference between a venture you know, backed company versus a bootstrap one? Yeah. That is so true. I think you were gunning for a prize. Maybe next. Okay. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. I'll get you something. Okay. Well, I'll, actually, let me answer that question with the next slide, and then we'll see how, we'll see how well we did. Okay. So let me just put these up here. Uh, there really are a lot of different things between a VC-backed company and a bootstrap company. Uh, your different pressures, culture, ownership being a big one. Goodness. Control. And I'll talk about all these here a little bit. And... Uh, <laughs> surprise, surprise. Okay. Don't know what that was. Okay. I, I will tell you, I am biased towards Bootstrap. Uh, and Scott's teaching you a lot of great things here, talking about getting products to a viable level before you go out and look for money. Uh, that is critical. Uh, let me share a personal story about a business uh, that we acquired here uh, about three and a half years ago. Uh, it was a direct competitor of ours. Uh, we'd been very cordial with them over the years. They're from up in Canada. I liked them. We always see each other and talk. And one day we ended up buying them. Uh, it was about three and a half years ago and spent, I don't know, about 40 million bucks on them. So the founder had started that business up 12 years earlier. 
had gone through a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, grown the business, raised money a few times. How much money do you think that founder made when we bought his business for $40 million? I might give a price for this one. Yeah. Yeah. Less than 300000 Actually, 150000 after taxes. So the question you have is, I thought it was all you know, roses if I could raise money. Everything was great. In moment battery. Oh, yeah. There we go. <laughs> I feel bad now because I didn't give you one. There you go. Okay. <laughs> that was kind of terrible of me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, kind of crazy. So you make tons of sacrifices, do all that stuff for 150,000 bucks. Yeah. So it's not all roses. It's tough. It's really tough. I'll come to questions in a second. And, and it's, it's hard to go through and see some of that stuff through. So let's talk a little bit about the VC company in more detail. So the parable of the business executive. I need a volunteer. Come on up. Okay. You know what's coming. I'm just going to mean. Okay. <laughs> what's your name? Jake. Jake. Thanks for coming up. Appreciate it. Okay. Jake, you've got a good imagination? Uh, sure. Okay, good. Work with me on this one. Okay, we're up in the mountains. Okay. And there's this beautiful chalet. It's huge. Okay. We're going to call it a mansion. Okay, but okay. they call them chalets in the mountain. I don't know. Okay, this is beautiful. It's right. got like 20 rooms. It's got, I mean, it's just everything you could possibly dream. Okay? okay. Off to the side is a toy barn with every toy you can imagine. It's just awesome, right? Okay. It also happens to sit right on the golf course. It's perfect, right? In ski in, ski out, golf in, golf out. I mean, okay. what's better than that? Okay, so it's awesome. Okay. Here's what I need you to do. All right. I need you to make some sacrifices. I need you to give 110%. I need you to go through and work 17 hour days for weeks, maybe months on end. And someday, all of that will be mine. Okay, you can take a seat. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, here we're done. We've got a couple. I've got a Cotopaxi branded in moment bag or, or this is a Spider Man t shirt. These are actually kind of cool. Yeah, I know. With our, with our logo in it. I'll take the bag. I know it. <laughs> I'm not. Oh, I, I know. I get it. <laughs> Okay, so, <laughs> these are some of the tough things that happen. Um, it, it can sometimes be good for the founder, but it's always good for the VCs. Just remember that, they will make sure they're protected, and you've got to make sure you're protected. Uh, a, a, a small success story around here. Uh, Vivint, anyone heard of Vivint when they got acquired? 3,000 employees, 2.5 billion by Blackstone or whatever they were. Blackstone, wasn't it? Yeah. it was. Anyone heard of that story? Yeah. Talked about Kind of a neat success story, right? Of the 3,000 employees, how many do you think had ownership in that business? There's nine. Close. That was good. Yeah, nine. Two of them happen to work for me now, so I know the inside story. Kind of crazy to think about. They'll make much more money off of InMoment than they did off of Pippin. Those two will. And they were two of nine. So, that's sometimes the part that's difficult, I think, when we look at it. You say, well, where's the success on that? In moments, had 20 employees pay off their mortgage. It's kind of cool to think about. And yeah, we're a little different, but that matters. I'll come to questions in a second, sorry. All right, so let's look at the next piece here. The bootstrap company. Uh, the table in your break room, this was actually my mother-in-law's table. Uh, none of the chairs in the conference room matched, let alone the office. None of your desks matched, and for that matter, they were left there by the last tenant. And running out of, ma out of money is just kind of a matter of doing business. Uh, bootstrap is not as uh, glorious as these businesses that go through and build ridiculously large buildings, spend a lot of money, someone else's money, uh, fast. It's kind of crazy. Now, after 16 years, we recently moved into a new building, and it's great. It's awesome. But we were in our old building, and we expanded 10 times before we chose to do that. And we made some very wise choices, very cautious choices. Now we're right off the, what do you call it, South Jordan um, Front Runner Station. We're, fi we're literally 500 feet from the, much less than that, it's like 100 feet away from the station. And it's great. It's great new office space, but we waited a long time to do that. We, we were very cautious with our money and made wise choices. So, why is that a big deal? We raised. Um, about $240,000, not a lot of money, from a few angels, three of them to be exact. 
and we'd received the first tranche of money, about eighty thousand dollars, and we had some targets in there that we had to hit. Now we missed the target on that first goal we had, which, by the way, was two months after we got the money. So not a lot of time to make a big deal, right? And some of that comes from naivete on my side because I was like, hey, crap, we got a lot of action going on. We're going to go through and hit these goals. It's going to be great. And so they were within their rights to not go through and, and give us any more of tranches of money from what we'd raised. But we went through and said, you know, what are we going to do here? We would started paying salaries. We started having some of these commitments. We had 10 employees. And I went to the employees and said, all right, here's the deal. Uh, the investors won't give us the next tranche of money, which means we don't have enough to pay our salaries. They said they will if we give them twice as much ownership as we originally agreed upon. Kind of nice, huh? So it gets you in a tight spot and uh, kind of stick it to you. And I asked the employees what they wanted to do. And I sat down with each one individually because I didn't want them to feel like a peer pressure thing. And each one of them said, you know what, I'd rather go without pay than to go through and be diluted like that because I'm a shareholder in this business. And it was a really cool thing because we were all in the foxhole together, right? Going through and building this business together, having that kind of experience. So every single one of them said, we're going to go without it. The tough thing is, <laughs> as entrepreneurs, we always believe that we're going to make it on that first jump. And, and I, I love to say that we, we believe that the second time we're going to make it, because we do as entrepreneurs. We always believe. Watch a little plus, we're going to make it this time. No. Same result. Matter of fact. I have to do it one more time because it just drives on the point. Okay, so it takes three failures. So remember that. You're going to fail three times. And it's okay. The VCs know it. And that's why it typically takes three rounds to go through and make your business viable. So you can either do it on their dime or your own dime. Make your own choices. But I'll tell you, the first time you show up for money, man, they treat you so good. It kind of sounds like this. Like, yeah, I feel pretty good. You know, and you have this money, and they're like going to give you anything, and you're like awesome, and here's 30 million, and no chains attached, and you're like, really? <laughs> Are you sure? And there's all sorts of things attached. Because you have to come back, because you will fail. And that's the tough part. So one in 10 software companies make it through their first year, and one in 10 of those make it up to 30 million in revenue. It's just a matter of fact. So, next time you show up for money. Man, you are so screwed. <laughs> there you are working for someone else. It's their company now, and you're like, why did I sign up for this? And you got to work another 12 years to make 150 grand. That sucks. So, yeah, think about it. It's so sad because it's so true. <laughs> the other thing that is really tough, and this part kills me. So these angels had literally, oh, it was, I think, 12% of our company, all right? Very small percentage. But they controlled something that's more important than ownership. They controlled the cash to our, basically, payroll of the employees. So in order to go through and get the first tranche of money, literally, and we only got the first tranche, <laughs> they made us hire somebody, kind of like what these guys did here. When we asked Reebok to send us certain text, some people thought we were crazy. Down low on the volume. But I'm a firm believer in paradigm breaking, outside the box singing. Bring us over! 15 minutes ago! Match! And since Terry's been with us, our productivity has gone up 46%. We're getting more from our employees than ever before. Oh. Sorry. I don't know what happened there. Oh, there to be honest, I wish you might send us 10 terror tanks. Hey, Mike, what are you doing? Oh, this is time. It's time, baby. So I. It's the best example I've ever seen of VCs requiring to hire certain people is that office linebacker mentality. And we had to hire this head of sales, which I was so excited to fire. 
<laughs> I couldn't get ready to get rid of them. And, and we were required to hire them and if we wanted to get the first tranche of money. Some of those crazy kind of things you have to do. So some of the byproducts of VC and I don't want to say it's all bad, but boy, oh boy, there's certain requirements that are sometimes tough. I have a question for you guys. Think back to when you were in fourth grade, okay? And you had these great dreams about what you wanted to be when you grew up. I grew up on the fly all day. So, thinking about this moving forward, what you wanted to be when you grew up. Uh, I had this little, I don't know, parable, I guess, if you will, I call kings, lords, and serfs, to try to understand the world a little bit. And the first category I call kings. Uh, we all know someone like this. Uh, these are people through little effort of their own. Uh, they either born into or fall into or are wildly successful. We all have a person like this. We look at it and go, really, them? And, you know, we never know the whole story, but I like to put them in this category I call kings or queens because the laws of the land don't really apply to them. So don't try. Just, just move past them and move on. Don't get so caught up in trying to evaluate why they're successful. The next group here, well, this is us. Just people working for the man. And this is the critical part I want you to keep away on this. You d they don't know the value they create, therefore they don't get the pay they deserve, okay? If you don't know the value you're creating in the business, expect to get the going rate. I don't know about you, but I don't like going rate. I want to get something that's based upon the value I'm creating. So understand that. This last category is really the whole reason we're talking today. And this is a category I call lords. Back in the old feudal days, if you went off and fought for somebody, you could come back and they'd give you land. Uh, that to me translates into equity, right? In today's world, if you can become an owner in a business, you get a chance to do something. The way you do this is by sacrifice. 10 employees in the early days of our company went without pay. Now, if had a very, you know, an amazing opportunity that's changed into something for them, a life-changing event. And I call that an employee entrepreneur. And so we'll talk about some of these steps here and how you can do that. So how do you change your stars? So how do we go about changing our stars and not being just another surf, right? And that's the whole reason you're in school. Understand differently than everybody else. Know the rules differently. So I have a few steps here. Uh, anytime you're going to get a job, evaluate it like it's a startup. 
the company I went and worked for was 15 years old. And I evaluated it differently. So you want to look at it and say, what's my chance of winning in this organization? How can I have an impact and make a change? So the first thing you want to look at is what I call fit. And is this what you're good at? Second one, where is your value? And what are your core skills? And the third one, ask this question. Can I be a key employee of this organization? Has anyone heard of key man insurance? Okay. We only have one nodder. This is as old as it is. Key man insurance. Thank you up there. So key man insurance. This is interesting. You're valued because if you were to be lost in the organization, at that point in time, the organization would suffer so much that they take insurance out on you to protect against the fact that if you were lost, right? And that's what we're looking for. So I came with these steps. I remember <laughs> the first time I, I went in to get my raise after I was working at that company right out of school, and I was rewarded with my first COLA. <laughs> Cost of living adjustment. Got like a 2% raise. I couldn't believe what I was doing. I'd worked 18 months at the company and built all these products. And I thought, why am I doing this <laughs> if I'm only getting a COLA? And I had to come up with some ways to figure out and understand that. So let's go through some of these steps. First one here. I've got a little grid here for you guys to evaluate yourself with. And there's three questions I want you to ask yourself here. First one is, what do I like doing? What am I good at? And what are people willing to pay me for it? It's my opinion that you need at least two of these to be a good job. So let's work through them here. So the first one, let's say for example, it's something you really like, but you don't happen to be very good at it, and no one's going to pay a lot of money for it. What is that? That's right, it's a hobby. See, starving artist. Okay, <laughs> very true. <laughs> okay, well, let's say this next one. <laughs> it, it, let's say for example, it's not something you like, <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't laugh about this. But, but you happen to be good at it. I happen to be good at finance. I can't stand doing it. It's just one of those things, right? I do that all day long and drive me nuts. And people aren't willing to pay you a whole lot of money for it. What is that? Well, this is a job and you are a surf. Welcome to 99% of the population. That's the tough part. People are paid the going rate, right? You have to figure out a, a way to break into the 1%. What about... If you're good at it and you get good pay. Remember, you got two checks here. And guess what? This is a good job, right? And you did something right by going to school and figuring out how to differentiate yourself, right? Next one. Let's say you like it and you're good at it, but the market won't necessarily reward you with a lot of pay. What is that? Lifestyle. Yeah. This job will make you content, but not necessarily rich. I have quite a few friends who have very good lives. They do great things, and they're great people, because they've managed to figure this out. The question is, think about it. Be in charge of your destiny, okay? That's the important thing here, is you're choosing jobs. Understand what it is you're choosing. Don't just end up as a surf. Okay, what about this next one? Let's say, for example, you don't like it, you're not good at it, and people don't pay a lot of money. Does that category exist? What is that one? Oh yeah, the government job. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it was funny. Okay, yeah, they throw one of those in. Although, I gotta tell you, this is, this is kind of weird. This one actually, I, I had to add this because someone yelled at me about this one when I presented this. This actually exists. <laughs> because apparently, it, and during the Obama administration, they started paying public servants more than the private sector, so I guess it does exist, so it's kind of crazy. So what if you get lucky enough to get three checks, right? Uh, that's the kind of thing that can happen being an employee entrepreneur. You have to participate in a different way, right? Okay, so that's evaluating a fit. Ask those questions to yourself. Figure it out. Next one, where is your value? So, oh, what's going on? Sorry about that. Keeps just bouncing me out there. Each of you know what you're good at by this point in time. The question is, when you go to get a job, does what you're good at line up with what they're paying you for? If it does, you have a much better chance of using your core skills, which will make much more money for the business than these kind of unrelated skills, right? Every job has these things. You're gonna do this, but then you spend 60% of your time doing this unrelated stuff. And, and are they good at explaining their value so 
they could be good at something but not take advantage of it because they don't know how to explain it properly. Well said, well said. Yeah, it, it's just this critical stuff to get in there, know what you're good at, know what your core skills are, make sure it lines up with the job, and then make sure when you get your job that you actually go through and find work to do. I know it sounds kind of crazy, but in businesses, they don't always have time to tell you what to do. You'll end up with being told certain things, but then you'll have extra time to be able to go through and do something else. And this is where you have to start figuring out what your sister skills are, right? Things that are closely associated with your core skills and how you can leverage yourself inside of a business. Finding opportunities where the business is dropping the ball and picking it up for the business. That's how you can go through and drive value, right? If you know your value, you can command your price. All right, next one here. These are my four steps of keyness, okay? And man, oh man, I remember that, that, that cost of living adjustment. It was brutal, I gotta tell you. I'd worked my guts off for 18 months and it was my first raise. And I just was so dis I was just so sad. I, was like, I know, I was so totally sad. And, and it was funny when he told me, he goes, well you just need to be more key around here. And I said, can you explain what you mean by when you say more key? And his reply to me was, I'll know it when I see it. And I went, great, I'm working for an art director. <laughs> I was like, God, I'm so frustrated. And uh, that's where I came up with this idea here, uh, these steps of keyness, and I, I teach them to each of our employees now. Step one is learn something of value that no one else in the company knows. You are key by the act of scarcity. So sometimes, these are the, the IT guy down the hall, he's the only one who knows how to print. <laughs> I mean, it's weird to say that, but there's always things that only you might know. Now, it's great to get to step one, and a lot of employees never get to step one, because they don't think about it that way, right? But it's a danger, and I also call this the, the my precious stage, because as soon as you learn that one thing, and you're the only one that knows it, what's your tendency to want to do? Kind of hold on to it, and my precious, and, and not let anybody else have it. Well, the reality is the most important thing you can do is move on to step two which is to teach someone else that great thing. Now, it seems kind of scary, because now you're suddenly saying, well, I no longer have that one thing that made me scarce in the first place. But you've become something more important to a business, because you've been able to duplicate knowledge. Anyone heard of Pluralsight? Their whole business model is this. That's it. Duplicating knowledge, that's it. Their whole model is just duplicating knowledge. It is a, one of the largest problems of any business that's trying to grow. So get to step two quickly. Teach someone else. Next step. Again, this won't be in your job description. Not at all. But this is think outside the box and create something of value for the company's top line. Uh, I have this pro company po policy we call 5X. The idea is for people to come up with an idea that generates five times its value. So we harvest ideas from employees all the time. And we try to tell them to say, focus on a 5X idea, and then it can be something we go out and build. So we encourage everybody to come up with it. The reality is a 5x idea is going to be 1 in 10. So come up with 10 ideas. You'll have one that's a 5x. Crank through them a lot. Now you have a key because you're an innovator. And the last step is to teach others to do this, to get past their job description, to start innovating. And now you're key because you're a leader in the organization. Okay? All right. Next one. Leadership values. Um, when you go out and interview, there's certain little tells that I would encourage you to look for. The first one is listening to how they talk about their business. Do they talk about their job or do they talk about like my company? It seems like a small thing, but it really is a reflection of the culture dramatically. People that are proud of their business wear the colors. I got my, this is my Darth Vader version of in moment t-shirt I went on. But uh, we wear the colors, right? They're reflective of who they are. And people wear it like a tattoo. And they're proud of the business they work for. And they talk about my company. They don't talk about my job. My job is a short-term thing. My company is someplace I want to be. A story I'd like to share with you, one I call Swimming with Gold. Uh, you're on a boat, and you're half a mile from shore. You have 90 pounds of gold on the boat. It's awesome, right? The only problem is the boat's sinking. And it's a half mile to shore. What are the chances you can swim with 90 pounds of gold on your back and make it to shore. It's not gonna happen, is it? Good news, you have five friends on the boat with you. You each have a chance to take 15 pounds of gold on your back and swim to shore a half mile. Can you make it? Yeah, it's gonna be a little hard. 15 pounds on your back's not easy. 
go through and swim, but you'll, you'll make it. But something amazing happens when you share the gold. It's a total loaves and fishes story. Because you end up on shore somehow with like 150 pounds of gold. It's kind of weird. And that's what's happened with our business. As we've shared the ownership out with more and more people, this accountability and drive has grown the business. And it's a great story to be a part of. Really cool. All right. So, a lot of different principles. You're learning a lot of different things here in school. And you're going to have a chance to either go out and start your own business or to choose to go be an employee entrepreneur somewhere. And the question is, how is that going to happen? How is it going to go down? Has anybody heard of this, the parable of the great sea captain? Anyone heard of this? Okay. Good. Oh, it'll be first. Okay. So there's once this great sea captain whose fame was known throughout the land. And any time he got involved with a naval battle, he always won. Kind of amazing. It was kind of an interesting little process that would happen. Because what would happen is an enemy vessel would be spotted out on the horizon, and the first mate would turn to the great sea captain. The great sea captain would turn to his first mate and say, fetch me my red shirt. He'd put on his red shirt. They'd go into battle. they win. It's kind of cool. Now, he didn't tell them why he wore a red shirt. He wore a red shirt because he didn't want his crew to see him bleed if they got into battle. It was a confidence thing, right? Well, one day, an armada of enemy ships is spotted on the horizon. The first mate looks excitedly towards the great sea captain. The great sea captain says, fetch me my brown pants. <laughs> Off we go into battle. <laughs> and sadly, that's true with a lot of entrepreneurs. Sometimes that's all it takes is just to stare him in the face and go in spite of it, right? So true. <laughs> Violent execution. <laughs> These are little tidbits. You know you've been there, the brown pants. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we talk about violent execution a lot. Uh, too often, people bandy ideas around to death, when the reality is violently executing is a much better way to get to success where you perfect the idea over time than trying to perfect the idea and then go out and execute. This one happens to be a quote from Patton, which I like. So to kind of wrap it up, and then we'll go into questions and stuff. How are we doing on time? Okay. Um, the world uh, would like you to follow its models. They would like to pay you going rate, the market rate for your job. Uh, and it tr cranks out people from universities in a lot of places. The goal that hopefully you have is to be more informed regarding the rules that are out there. And the nice thing is there is a whole new world out there, a chance for you to go through and be something different. You don't have to start your own business. Maybe a question to you, how many want to start your own business here? Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Okay. So for those of you that don't want to start your own business, you may have to get a chance to try it. But that's the cool part is you can go out and be an employee entrepreneur. You can learn a lot of things. You can participate in the business. There's businesses out there right now that need people. I've had a chance to talk a lot up and down the Wasatch Front, and it's amazing how many people are saying, you know what, we're going to go through and try to get this business viable before we do this and go through and then raise money when we need to scale it, but not before. And that changes the rules around, right? Changes around who has control of business. We're 16 years old and we still control. The employees own our business. And it's great to be in that situation where we can say, hey, our business is you know, majority employee owned. And we can choose to say how we're going to grow the business at this point in time. That isn't always the case. It's, it's a rarity, frankly, for most businesses in, in Utah. But that's what we want to encourage you to do. So to wrap it up, let's go through and change and say welcome to the new world. I'll play this little clip here. Oh, volume. Oh, there's my family. <laughs> um, thank you for letting me have a chance to come in and talk with you. I'll let the clips finish in there. Okay. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a neat time to be coming out of school. And Utah's in a great place right now. But thanks for letting me get a chance to talk with you and love to answer any questions. <laughs>